Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Honorable Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Gerhard. Years ago, uh, I had an opportunity to introduce Justice Ginsburg at a lay event in New Mexico. And my husband, uh, having heard me speak the first few sentences, said he thought I'd lost my voice a little bit. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, and the truth is, that I had been moved to tears because when I announced Justice Ginsburg's name, and she started to walk onto this stage in Santa Fe, New Mexico, people spontaneously stood up and welcomed her with such warmth, joy, and appreciation that I thought to myself, this is truly a living treasure. And <laughs> But just to be clear about who this person is, everybody in this room knows Justice Ginsburg uh, probably more about you than you wish. Uh, Justice Ginsburg served on our council for many years, brilliantly as she did everything else. She is, I think, the only person ever to have served on both the Harvard and Columbia Law Review. What uh, some of us especially appreciate is that at a time when the ability of many of us who look like me uh, was called into question at every place, uh, there was fighting for us, somebody who wasn't uh, taller than I was, was much <laughs> thinner than I was, was much smarter than I was, and in her quiet voice, managed to persuade courts and law school faculties and the public at large that the rights of women were important to this country, not just for women, but for all of us. In fact, she did it so well that I thought as I became aware of what she was doing representing me before I ever knew her, I thought at the back of her very elegant suit, it should say, deceptive packaging. <laughs> In a week in which she has hardly anything else to do, <laughs> I took my uh, heart in my hand and picked up the phone to call her, standing up as I always do when I speak to her on the phone, <laughs> out of great respect, to ask her if she would join us today to give an award to someone who is deeply important to the Institute, to me personally, and I know a friend of hers. And she said without one moment of hesitation, I can hardly wait to come. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I can tell you the first time I ever met Roberta. Roberta, I don't know if you remember this, but it was on the stage at Lincoln Center, and you had just become the first woman to head the American Bar Association. Well, it is, for me, a special pleasure to be with you. You know that this award, the ALI Distinguished Service Award, is not an every year thing. It is presented only occasionally to people who are contributors supreme to the well-being of the Institute. So I count it a privilege to present the award to Gerhard Casper, 
whose wisdom and caring have guided the ALI since he became a council member in 1980. The annual meeting program describes how much good Gerhardt has done for the Institute. On a very long list, he chaired the nominating committee from 2004 to 2010, and in that capacity, he ensured the continuing excellence of the ALI's leadership, its council, officers, members of the executive and audit committees. From 2001 to 2007, he served on the program committee, assisting the director in deciding which projects to launch, who should be engaged as reporters, which projects needed revision. <laughs> Advisor to the pro project on principles of the law of charitable nonprofit organizations since 2002, he has advanced that enterprise by bringing to the discussion table his experience as a prominent and uncommonly successful leader in the academic world. Concerned about the ALI's significance to promising young scholars, Gerhardt inspired a gathering of the best among young men and women newly engaged in law teaching. And that meeting led to the ALI Young Scholars Medal, first awarded in 2011 and now presented every other year to an early career law professor whose work has the potential to influence improvements in the law. In 1988, the Institute celebrated its 75th anniversary and sought an annual dinner speaker whose intelligence, grace, and humanity would captivate the audience. Gerhardt fit that bill perfectly. I believe that at that event, he spoke about a subject very dear to his heart, academic freedom. In the last weeks, I have been reading Gerhardt's newest book. The book is titled The Winds of Freedom. And it has received accolades from educators nationwide. It describes some of the challenges Gerhard met as Stanford's president from 1992 to 2000, with flashbacks to his earlier adventures in academia at the universities of Hamburg and Freiburg, Yale Law School, Berkeley, and for 26 years at the University of Chicago, first as a law professor, then dean of the law school, and after that, provost of the university. I had one question about the winds of freedom. I asked Gerhardt Sunday night, was there time for sleep? <laughs> Precious little, he admitted. During his presidency of Stanford, he explained his aims for the university in a 1,000 speeches, averaging one every three days, and written in Gerhardt's own hand. He faced issues of great moment, serving constantly to demonstrate the values of free inquiry and tolerant debate. And demanding his attention also were issues of a less weighty kind. And in that category, I would place the irate reaction of some alums to a plan to move the first hole of Stanford's golf course <laughs> to make room for urgently needed faculty housing. Sacrilegious. A one objective charged. 
And then, during the last two years of his presidency, by seniority, he became the chairman of the then Pacific 10 Athletic Conference. Uh, the first question raised during his tenure, should the Pac-10 use baseball bats of wood or of aluminum? <laughs> Somehow, he managed to write two books while steering Stanford's course, one on cares of the university, the other on a topic that has long engaged his bright mind, the separation of powers. Gerhard has received honors and prizes galore from educational institutions in the United States and abroad. He served and still serves on numerous advisory councils and the list of his scholarly articles and comments and reviews runs a dozen pages. One indication of the breadth of his talent, he might have succeeded as a rival to Ralph Lauren. <laughs> uh, I say that because when he was new on campus, Gerhardt found the official Stanford tie unappealing. <laughs> the, the design was a redwood tree bisecting a block S. It looked to Gerhardt like a crude dollar sign. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he replaced it with a new design, cardinal red. It displayed Stanford shield and blue diagonal lines bearing the school's motto, which happens to be in German, <laughs> Die Luft der Freiheit Welt. In English translation, the, the motto is the title of Gerhardt's most recent book. The President Casper tie, I'm told, though more expensive, is ever so much more popular <laughs> than the tie it replaced. Uh, Gerhardt much admired Gerald Gunther, Stanford's revered professor of constitutional law who was, to both of us, an inspiring teacher, a sage counselor, and a cherished friend. Words written by Gerhardt in memory of Professor Gunther seem to me to fit Gerhardt himself. His subtlety, situation sense, learning and professionalism have touched legions of colleagues and students. The pressure of a relentless clock may have eased for Gerhardt, now serving as senior fellow at Stanford's Freedom is a Spogli Institute for International Studies. But in that post, and as professor of law, political science, and undergraduate education, he remains an ardent contributor to the search to know. And so Gerhardt, for all you have done to make, in your words, studies blossom and minds move, everyone in this audience joins me in arousing bravo. May you have freedom to take pleasure in the life of the mind and may there be, in the years to come, scores of encores of your engagement with matters of enduring importance.
Justice Ginsburg has been, I have known her as Ruth for 30 years. She is still Ruth to me, and I love you. <laughs> this was, I'm, I'm moved to tears <laughs> the way you were. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, While the Distinguished Service Award is clearly a great, a very great honor that I do not deserve, I confess that I'm nevertheless disappointed. <laughs> As Justice Ginsburg mentioned, and by the way, she not only read my book, but she uh, understood uh, and appreciated what is important to me in that book. As Justice Ginsburg mentioned, I have very recently published this book, book with the title The Winds of Freedom. Uh, you all want to get a copy. Uh, <laughs> um, the book is about universities and about scholarship. Frankly, uh, given the publication and my relative youth, <laughs> I would have found the ALI's Young Scholars Medal more appropriate for me. <laughs> President Remo never tires of saying age 70, uh, of characterizing age 74 as early adolescence at the ALI. <laughs> I certainly do qualify in that respect. Justice Ginsburg, President Remo, Director Liebman, ladies and gentlemen. I just said that I do not deserve the honor bestowed upon me, and I mean it. Expressions of my modesty are kept in check only by my being mindful of Prime Minister Golda Meir's famous response to an awardee who overdid his displays of humility. Quite exasperated by his excessiveness, she cut him off. Don't be so humble, you are not that great. <laughs> I know that without having to be told. <laughs> I have been a member of the American Law Institute for almost 40 years and was elected to the council in 1980 shortly after I had become dean of the University of Chicago Law School. As a then definitely youthful 43-year-old immigrant boy who speaks funny English and teaches American constitutional law and history, I certainly did not fit right in. And by the way, let, let me say something about the funny English. It really is funny. I, uh, I, Judge Laval, uh, a couple of nights ago, demonstrated uh, an app he has on his iPhone, uh, a, a dictation app. You dictate, and then the text is being produced. And I said to him, uh, Pierre, uh, that does not work for people speaking funny English terribly well. And so he did an immediate test. Uh, he dictated something, uh, and it was reproduced perfectly. Then he gave it to me, and about half of my sentence came through accurately, and the rest was garbled. So uh, there is no, no question about uh, uh, the, the funniness of my uh, English. But not only uh, uh, did I not fit in because I was, my field was American constitutional law and history, and for one, the ALI was not about, about to embark on a restatement of constitutional law. <laughs> also, I did not even know anything about estate planning. Probably the greatest compliment I was ever paid in my work for the Institute came from Harvard's uh, Jim Kasner, to whom Lance referred uh, to the, uh, yesterday, when he served as a reporter on estate planning and I disagreed with him on a fairly subtle point. Dean Casper, he said, for somebody who has never studied trusts and estates, that was a pretty perceptive comment. <laughs> 
I have had the great privilege of being a council member during the presidencies of M.I. Carter, Rod Perkins, Charlie Wright, Michael Trainer, and last but in no way least, Roberta Ramo. The ALI directors during this period were only three, Herbert Wexler, Jeff Hazard, my one-time Chicago colleague, and Lance Liebman. All directors and members of the council and the institute provided me with challenging opportunities to engage in the unceasing process of inquiry about the law. And for this, I am deeply grateful to all of you. Lance, I see you leave office with great sadness. Throughout my life, I have worked with many people in positions like yours, though I cannot remember many who served the way you did, with outstanding judgment and understanding, but always low-keyed and with a sense of irony and humor that has been most endearing. Thank you, Lance. While the ALI was not and is not about to do a restatement of constitutional law, public law has received increasing attention, especially during the years of Lance's directorship, above all in the form of what we call principles projects. As I am feeding into the background, I hope the Institute will increase its attention to public law, even, God forbid, constitutional law. What makes the American Law Institute so unique is that it provides a place for the intelligent, rational discussion of important issues without the polarization that characterizes so much of our legislative discourse. As our electoral system, with its gerrymandered districts, with its uninterrupted electioneering, with its dependence on money-raising machine, machines, and with the more or less unlimited opportunities to buy influence, can hardly be viewed with much confidence or optimism. We desperately need organizations such as the American Law Institute that put the premium on careful analysis of legal policies and on searching intellectual honesty. The, instit the Institute's contribution to the education of the public is perhaps more indirect than direct. However, we are performing an essential task. In the language of economics, what we do and what we need to do is patiently and over the long run to build up the right intellectual habit capital. I, of course, understand that the ALI cannot and should not do everything. However, I'm wondering whether, in addition to restatement and principal projects, we should perhaps regularly convene focus or issue groups that will enable the Institute to address some of the pressing problems of our life as a nation. One of them we heard about during lunch, the delivery of legal services. I shall give one other topical example that will frighten many of you, but this, that is at the core of so many evils, campaign finance. Intelligent and rational discussion here too may help to build up habit capital that increases the public's demand for fair and effective norms. A primary task of government is the task of setting substantive priorities and implementing these priorities in a competent and fair manner. Capacity to govern, to set priorities, to deliver services seems to be in low supply worldwide. Perhaps it is time for the Institute to address not just corporate governance, but governance of the public realm as well. As somebody who still carries his copy of the Constitution with him, I wish our governance system would again become a major object of analysis and recommendations. 
I have a friend, I had a friend, uh, he died last year, the novelist Richard Stern, who was a member of the University of Chicago English Department, about which he frequently said that he loved it the way he loved Brown Betty. I quote, 70 odd years ago, my father cautioned me about saying I loved Brown Betty. You can't love what cannot love you. You <laughs> like Brown Betty. But, Stern continued, I did love that grand fusion of apple crumb and hot sauce. <laughs> and I say that I love and have loved the English department for over half a century. The way Richard Stern loved his English department, I have loved the American Law Institute for 40 years. Thank you all. I will say as uh, the Justice and Gerhard walk out, uh, she did not mention one of his uh, reasons for success at Stanford. I've teased him for many years that he had what every university president needed, a psychiatrist wife. 